Students Lecture Series. This event is meant to be a continued conversation at Hope College. Tonight, we will hear a keynote lecture from Reverend Ricardo Tavares. Immediately after the lecture, we will have a Q&A discussion where you will be able to ask questions via a Google form. To submit any questions, please scan the QR code on the screen, or we have note cards for you to write your questions, and we will submit them online for you. Um, Polly will be able to do that for you back there. Um, she has those note cards. All right. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land we stand on. Together, we acknowledge that we gather as Hope College on the traditional land of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. As a community, we recognize the ever-present systemic inequities that stem directly from past wrongdoings. We acknowledge this long history of injustice and commit to educating ourselves and our community as we seek to honor the legacy and culture of indigenous peoples. We are grateful to PRISM, Grow Advocacy Council, and the Center for Diversity and Inclusion for their support in sponsoring this program. Again, thank you for coming to this lecture, and I hope you enjoy it. But more importantly, I hope you learn something new that will inspire you. Before we begin, we also have a short video that we would like to show you, just to kind of set the tone. <laughs> My mom, when, she, when I told her I was gay, actually took me to like a psychiatrist. And I remember coming out and the psychiatrist <coughs> being like, there's nothing wrong with your daughter, she's perfectly healthy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, and I was like, <laughs> Watching TV, you see a lot of you know fairy tales, and you see men and women, men and women getting married. You see, hear it in songs. You this is everything you're surrounded by, like heteronorms. So I was really trying to um, mold myself into what a straight man looks like. <coughs> it's kind of a blur because I was trying to be someone other than me. It was just like kind of like a transition from like I'm a tomboy, I'm a tomboy to like oh I'm like really. I have uh, a best girlfriend, uh, my best friend, uh, and about the same time that I came out, she did as well, and it, it was just really helpful to have two people doing that at the same time, and it kind of brought us closer together. Even when I was coming out, like I still had things that I've heard from like friends and family growing up about, you know, gay people. Um, there were still those attitudes left over in my mind, so I had to like really educate myself and immerse myself into that community and that world. I've been more comfortable in talking about it, but it's still not so good. Hi, I'm Jen, bye. <laughs> One of my closest friends, I've been talking to her about how I had been dating a, a girl, and I really thought she was really cute, but I also liked the guy too, and she said, she got really fed up with me, and she said, well, you have to pick sometime, like, whichever one you're gonna be with. What does their gender have to do with how I feel about them? When people find out you're gay, like it, it, like it, it raises something in them. They feel in danger. They want to change you. And I've even had a priest once in high school tell me that you know I need to redeem my life um, in my sociology class in front of the whole class. And an argument with him, speaking up for myself publicly was a really, really empowering moment for me at such a young age. There are so many different colors on the LGBTQ spectrum. You know, there's trans, there's you know, lesbians, bi, you know, gender fluid, gender queer, there's so many subgenres of like, you know, people in our community. At the end of the day, I really had to accept that there wasn't really a single subculture that was gonna define me. I had to accept that I was made of all of these things and that all of these identities don't necessarily make be accepting of yourself, um, even though other people might not do it. Maybe I lost a few Facebook friends over it, but at the end of the day, that's okay. How you feel <laughs> is not what everyone says that you are. That's a little confusing. <laughs> you're gonna have to own it. You're gonna have to get your spoon, you're gonna have to dig down deep, and be like, all these layers are mine, and the sooner you do it, the sooner you'll really know yourself.
Good evening. My name is Haley Schumann. I'm the mentoring president of PRISM, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Reverend Ricardo um, Tavares. Uh, Reverend Tavares is an artist, writer, and speaker local to Grand Rapids, Michigan. He is an Afro he is an Afro-Latino, Dominican, and Puerto Rican heritage and proudly part of the queer community. He delivers a unique intersection of writing, um, visual art, and public speaking that reflect on race, gender, queerness, social justice, faith, and doubt. Tavares' journey into the arts and writing began as a youth, as he initially discovered his gift for communication in both mediums. As he developed these abilities, his sensibilities uh, sensitivities to social inequities also developed, largely shaped by dwelling in community spaces home to immigrant and Af African American residents of Grand Rapids. With his family deeply involved in their church and faith, his calling became clear in his life as he sought ways to bridge social action with a, faith, a life of faith and devotion. Seeing the needs for leadership skills and development in his community, he pursued an education that would allow him to invest in these needed resources back into his neighborhood and empowering others to do the same. Um, after graduating high school, he went on to an, earn an Associate of Arts in Business Administration at Grand Rapids Community College, a dual undergraduate degree at Kuiper College in Bible and International Business and Marketing with a minor in Communications. Finally, he acquired a Master's of Divinity from Calvin Theological Seminary with a concentration in Missions. Today, Tavares writes poetry, essays, and short fiction. As a multidisciplinary visual artist, he also uses photography, paint, charcoal, and graphite pencil as extension of his storytelling. He is he's a recognized preacher, often bringing his storytelling methods to bear from the Sunday morning pulpit. As a reverend, he is a bivocational pastor leading a faith-based nonprofit called New City Neighbors as its executive director while pastoring in Vivo Church, a queer affirming church plant he founded in 2016. He is a member of Grand Valley Artists and an artist with uh, Art Exchange GR. Its creative tools of choice are pencil and paper in every area of his professional work. And now here is uh, Reverend Ricardo Tavares. stationary mic. Um, I gave you a lot to read. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so the Lord be with you. Before I begin, I'd like to offer a poem titled Garden for our reflection. Meet me in the garden where I dig my knees into the dirt, praying, where my brow sweat falls to the earth that waits with its mouth open, hoping to see the children of God revealed. They told me I could be anything, so I chose to be me. They told me I could be everything, but I chose to be free. They handed me a shovel, asked me if I wouldn't change my mind. Silence. They told me, get to digging. Everybody watching, everybody waiting for a revolution, and everybody taken to fallen asleep. Silence. But not me. I am getting ready to be planted. And if this body has to die, then so be it. All morning I threw dirt over my shoulder, hauled then a few rocks, a boulder, till I could stand waist deep in their sin. Did it all day, till the sun faded its rays, 
till till I was ready to lay me down to become the garden full of tiger lilies and an oak tree that will shade the hunger of a generation yet to be created. So here I pray as you walk away talking about my potential to grow. And now I lay, cross my arms over my chest, ready for this blessed rest, but eyes always wide open. Silence. I wait. Silence. Will anyone bury me? Then the earth shudders. I hear the voice. Not yet. I am both humbled and honored to be the speaker at the second year of the affirming LGBTQ plus lecture series here at Hope College. So thank you to Hope for holding this event and to the staff of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion for this invitation to be the keynote speaker this year. The practice of diversity and inclusion does not happen without thoughtful and intentional action. And so you as a staff play a pivotal role in making Hope College a place that goes beyond welcoming diversity to ensuring that all students are empowered to create a better world, including the microcosm of the world that exists on this campus, regardless of ethnicity, gender expression, and identity, or sex and sexual orientation. And thank you to the students of PRISM that hold up a light of inclusion and belonging for LGBTQ plus students at this institution. I know you didn't ask to become trailblazers. <laughs> you didn't ask to become trailblazers in a shifting culture, and yet here you are. You are creating a legacy as you stand on the shoulders of those that came before you, as you prepare a place for those that are yet to come. I see you. We see you. In my preparation to deliver this lecture, I had to ask myself, why was I asked to stand in this place? Now I know it's not because I am ever short of words. If you're friends with me, you know that Ricardo always has something to say. And I don't ask the question for a lack of self-worth or confidence, but do so in an honest attempt to be faithful to the call in this hour. In addressing the affirmation of human beings and image bearers of God that are consistently labeled as other because of their gender identity, gender expression, and because of their sexual orientation and who they love, there are many paths, I believe, that I could take in delivering such an address. And we've come to hear and maybe listen to a lecture on affirming queer students at a Christian college in a part of the country that has been dramatically shaped by an enculturated expression of Reformed theology. Mm -hmm. So I ask myself, as I speak, should I hike through the landscape of doctrinal minds that are set out intentionally by the capital C Church 
Should I take the path of using my theological prowess that I earned at the flagship seminary of the unaffirming Christian Reformed Church of North America? And maybe tease out the nuances of the clobber passages that are often rocket fired at the queer community, knowing that there are armchair theologians in the proverbial room ready to take notes on any misstep I take. As an openly gay minister in a sex marriage, a same-sex marriage that was pushed out of his denomination, I'm all too familiar with the debates happening in our churches, Bible colleges, and seminaries on the limits that men in power want to put on God's grace. Mm -hmm. As if understanding alone could hold the love of an infinite God. Reverend M. Barclay, who was here last year um, for this lecture, I want to quote what they said. I know how often in Christian educational spaces, queer students are left to endure spiritual violence in the name of public discourse. Mm -hmm. And so I ask myself, Am I here to convince an audience that the grace of the cross is enough for the people that get caught in the crossfire? It would be easy to slip into the terrain of shouting matches, where voices like mine are often not welcomed and become paralyzed in the silence that is imposed upon me. Another quote I offer to you from the book Heavy Burdens, by Bridget Eileen Rivera. We get lost in the statistics. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth contemplate suicide three times more often than heterosexual youth and are 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide if they experience family rejection. 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide at least once in their lifetime. And of that number, 92% attempted suicide before the age of 25. Mm -hmm. Of all teen suicides from 2013 to 2015, nearly 25% were LGBTQ. Of all homeless youth in the United States, 40% are LGBTQ. In the span of a year, an estimated 1.8 million LGBTQ youth between the ages of 13 and 24 were, will seriously contemplate suicide. Those statistics come from the Trevor Project. And while I had just picked up This book, Heavy Burdens, the irony, I couldn't bear to look up any more recent statistics. Those were heavy enough. We turn people into numbers, and when we do so, it's easier to silence their voices and ignore their stories. And so rather than dwell on some of the matters I just mentioned, I believe it's better for us to consider the lived experiences of queer identifying individuals. And that's what I hope to center in my address this evening by sharing some of my own story. This event is meant to be the continuing of a crucial conversation on the affirmation of students that are part of the queer community. The conversation might begin this evening at Hope College, but it must, it must continue beyond the halls of academia and into the lived experiences of a community at large. The humanity of queer identifying persons should never be up for debate. When a minority group of people are labeled as a problem to be solved, it's too easy for a majority to create a final solution that demolishes the humanity that is left in all of us. So let me tell you a story. And 
then said I wrote it. <laughs> Matthew 13 44 Jesus speaking to his followers gives them this parable the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when a man found it he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. And this is the point where I put my notes away. Yeah. And we're just gonna get real. <laughs> a man finds a treasure in a field, sells all he has, and then buys that field. Almost seems a little shady, doesn't it? Why didn't he tell the owner that there was treasure in his field? Understanding the context in which Jesus is speaking, this is a time and a place in history where it was not uncommon for people to hide their treasures underground, to mark places where they could be safe, and keep them out of hands of thieves, tuck them away, leave them alone until the time was necessary to retrieve said gold, silver, or other treasures. But in this particular instant, whether, whether because the owner of the treasure went away, some theologians say because he might have gone to war, or you know, there's other theories on, on how this might have happened. Maybe someone just forgot about it, passed away, and didn't tell someone else. The point is, is that the treasure is laid in the field and undiscovered by the owner. You could imagine that perhaps weeds have overgrown in the place where this treasure has been hidden, grass, other seeds that have germinated. And the owner of the field has not done due diligence to go out and take care of his property. He does not value the property. He has not taken care of it. He has not hired any hands or, or even leased the land to someone else so that they could grow on it and make good use of it. And so this man, uh, whether working in the field or simply passing through, discovers this treasure and sees its value and understands it has more worth than perhaps what he can imagine right away. And so he goes and he sells everything to purchase this field. And the owner of the field, completely oblivious to what's been waiting there the entire time, sells it, practically gives it away. And this man is all the richer for that decision. I'm going to come back to this story. I want to talk to you about another field. I have the privilege of being the executive director of an organization called New City Neighbors. Haley mentioned that in the introduction delivered a few moments ago. In 2019, I found myself um, looking for a different avenue of work, something that would allow me to invest more in my communities. Uh, I was uh, very interested in community development work. That's been what I, what I had done historically um, before basically losing my job as a pastor, and I'll get to that as well. And so I found myself investigating this organization, which I had heard of, do we need new batteries for this? Okay, I'll keep going, and if not, I, I can talk really loud. <laughs> so 
I applied for this position of executive director and I, I had seen pictures of this field, I had seen pictures about this organization and what they did. I knew that they were a youth-centered organization, but I had no clear idea of the scope of what it was until I got onto the grounds where they had their urban farm. In the middle of the Creston neighborhood, tucked away behind a few houses, was a three-acre farm in the middle of the city where this organization employed youth to go out into the field to learn about growing good and healthy food, paying them to get their hands dirty, and this beautiful field at the time was surrounded by yellow and purple cone flowers, echinacea. And as I pulled up into the parking lot and saw bees and butterflies fluttering around these flowers, I just thought to myself, I have to go out into this field and see this for myself. So before I entered into the space where the interview was being conducted, I saw tomatoes of various sizes being grown, peppers, kale, lettuce, eggplant, summer squash. It was this glorious sight. I went and had my interview. I met some of the students that were there at the time. One of them is actually here. She's no longer a student. She works for our org as an adult staff member now. It's this glorious experience. I get the job as the executive director of this organization uh, the tail end of 2019 around November. At the time, there's a financial hardship that the organization is experiencing, which is one of the reasons why they want me to come on board to help pull them out of this hardship and give some direction to the organization. And so I'm working part-time for a few hours um, with the org, then go full-time, and the week that I become a full-time executive director, the church that was the partner organization of New City Neighbors, sends us an email and says that they are dissolving the relationship we have with this organization over theological differences which amount to the fact that I am a gay minister. Now for context, the land that was being used for the farm belonged to the church. We were leasing the land um, to do our programming. We had some office space in the church, not a whole lot, but we had access to its facilities. And the church itself was the, the, uh, the impetus for creating this organization. It was their brainchild. It became its own 501c3 and continued doing faith-based work with youth but when it came to the point where I was hired as the executive director, it didn't matter how this organization began. It didn't matter the impact that it was having on the community. All of that they were willing to go away with or do away with. So if you can imagine in the middle of the pandemic 2020, this urban farm that provides food to at the time about four or five food resource centers slash food pantries that provided work to up to uh, 20 youth a year plus adult staff. The church said no. And we had to fight for the right to sort of, well maybe fight's not the right word, we came to an understanding. <laughs> And we remained on that property up, up, up until recently. And so, um, to be clear, the church did give us an extension on the time that we should be there. But in the end, the charity was not enough. We had to relocate and find another way to do our programming. And so where this field was, now there's this. That hurts, doesn't it?
Is this what love looks like? Is this what it means to follow the gospel? Is this what it means to take a stand on your values? Do you know the treasure that is lying in your untended field? Are you aware of the countless value that is lying in wait just for someone to pick it up and claim it as theirs, to give it purpose, to give it meaning. In the parable that Jesus shares, the man gives away everything because he understands that what he has right now is nothing compared to what can come of picking up the treasure that is in the field. I lead a church called En Vivo. Started in 2016. At the time, it was part of the Christian Reformed Church. I was an ordained minister with that denomination. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, that's why you guys put this water here. <laughs> time while I was not necessarily walking around waving a rainbow flag, I did um, admit and say that I, that I was gay. And if anyone asked, I, I probably would have told them. But I didn't feel that it was my responsibility to come out to everyone that I met. Imagine that. And so after I did go a little more public with who I am and um, and what I was experiencing within myself, I was essentially pushed out of my denomination and this church plant that I started was also just freely given away. No one even fought for it. So for a little more context, when In Vivo Church started its very first worship service, had about 60 people. It was on the south side of Grand Rapids on Division Avenue, not too far from the heart of the city. Worship was uh, multi-generational, uh, multi-racial. We had all the colors on the stage. I mean, I was checking off all the boxes, y'all. Worship was in English and in Spanish. It was this glorious endeavor. And we only continued to grow and excel as we found our own identity. But at the point where I became public about being gay, all of this was sort of tossed away. And I ended up with a church that had just three members left. And at the time, we were meeting on Sunday mornings, and we would sit around a table with bagels and yogurt and just have breakfast together. And I remember walking in on one particular Sunday morning thinking, oh man, it's, it's all gone, it's over. This church plant has failed. I am ready to just say to all the people, all two of them, <laughs> that our journey is over, it's been great, it's been real, it's time to move on. And as I'm coming to my seat with my Bible in hand, someone walks in the door and says, is this in Vivo Church? I heard this was a place where I would be okay, where I would be safe, where I could ask my questions. So we didn't close the church that day because that would have been awkward. <laughs> so I said, come on in, have some toast, have, put some cream cheese on it, have a seat, get some coffee, we'll, we'll talk, what are your questions? 
and we had church together and that lasted for two or three weeks and then after that I'm like okay we're s this is still going nowhere it was going nowhere Haley I was just ready to just call it quits I come back in on a particular Sunday ready to just give my speech had it all written out was going to close in prayer and as we're getting ready to start someone else walks in the door and says is this in vivo church actually it's more like is this in vivo church <laughs> i heard this was a place where i would be okay i'm gay and i'm just trying to figure this whole thing out this continued to happen over and over and over again until we had a small, consistent group. And now today at Vivo Church is about 40-ish members strong. I'm looking at our board chair there. Is that, is that about right? We worship on Sunday evenings. And our church is mostly people who identify as LGBTQ+. We have a few token straights. <laughs> And we are seeking God's face together, encouraging one another. Many of us have been kicked out of our families, kicked out of our previous churches, ready to give up on God. And now we sit around round tables together, debating on whether or not the sermon that was preached actually has any relevance. And today we are the church. Amen. One of our token streets. <laughs> Do you know the value of what is in your own backyard? Do you understand what you're willing to let go? Or do you truly understand what you're fighting for? Listen, I was all ready to come in here and tackle the clobber passages, but man, just go read a book. <laughs> this is real life. Real people are getting hurt. Real people are contemplating suicide. Real people are wanting a relationship with God and are wondering, can you help me get there? What are we putting in the way of our students, our young people, that God did not put in the way of them getting to the cross? In Vivo Church, uh, last year, this past summer, we, we went to Pride together. It was awesome. We were giving away t-shirts and rainbow flags and bracelets and talking to all kinds of folks. And it was just kind of like a really high moment for us as a church you know, living into our full identity, not hiding that, you know, we're queer Christians. We're like Jesus and, and sparkles and glitter and all of that. Drag queens too. That's a, another lesson though. I won't go into that. Um, but we, we took the opportunity to ask people in the community to respond to a survey while we were there. So we're like, respond to a survey, you might win a t-shirt. Like, you know, a little, a little give here. And it was so amazing and heart-wrenching to see the responses to the questions that we got. So this was the main question. Do you have ideas about how a church can be a support or resource to the community? Please share those ideas here. And people were allowed to fill in the blank. There were 310 responses. 47% of those responses, almost half, express a desire or need for LGBTQ plus student support services. Not even asking whether or not you, they could come in as, as full Christian believers to serve in your church, but just expressing the need for resources in the community. So I decided to share some of the responses here with you. One was simply youth support. Social event groups for teens. We are here to talk about affirming LGBTQ plus students, right? Mm -hmm. All right, stay with me. 
making sure that LGBTQ youths are, are, is safe. That was a copy and paste, not my ear. <laughs> Acceptance and programs to help kids meet up. Just say the right pronouns. Shelter. Open your doors. Temporary help for LGBTQ who need to be safe. Why do we have church buildings? if we're not gonna use them to make people feel safe. Right. Offer therapy services to youth. Provide housing and financial assistance to LGBTQ youth and provide active counseling to reduce suicide. My God, that sounds so reasonable. Help people want to live their life. Providing support resources for LGBTQ youth and individuals and providing educational resources for families of queer people. Spread your church's message to the city so that other churches can understand that this will be the way to show Jesus' love. Just continue spreading your message. There are so many youth who think God hates them. There's treasure in the field waiting, holding its value, hoping someone finds it, picks it up and includes it in some good work and investment. It's amazing to me when I have coffee and conversation with LGBTQ folks, or folks that are part of the queer community and they express some of the pain that they are experiencing I was looking for a quote in my notes here. I think I'm going to give up on that. But essentially, what it comes down to is, why can't I be included in God's work? Why can't I be included in the kingdom that God is building? Who are we to determine who can be used or not. Thank you. So if you have questions, please scan that QR. 
on the screen now. And we also have note cards if you prefer to write them down and then to submit them electronically. Polly is on her hand right there. You can find them with her. So my first question will be, what advice would you give to a student who is making moves to go back to the church or simply to religion in general? Um, well, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here and speak and share some of my experience. Um, and thank you for, for the input that um, the PRISM students gave when I did meet with them a few weeks ago to talk about this lecture. Um, what advice would I give to a student that, can, can you tell me the question? What advice would you give to a student who is making moves to go back to the church or simply to religion in general? Yeah, um, I would do some research. So there's uh, there are resources out there. Um, churchclarity.org is one. Um, Gaychurchithink.org or .com. Uh, don't know exactly the. <coughs> The full URL, but th there are resources out there that will give you um, answers to whether or not this church is, is open and affirming, whether or not this church is a place that will receive my, my gifts um, or what I have to offer. Um, and so, first of all, yes, please come back to the church. We would love to have you. Um, I know our church would, but it's, it's important to also feel safe, right? And, and so many so many young people have been hurt by the church. Um, and that's really unfortunate. Um, but to anyone who, who is interested, I would say there, there are resources out there. Um, check those out and, and find ways to explore your faith and maybe um, ways that are, that are safer. Um, there might be um, small groups that you can plug into. Um, there might be other opportunities like that, and so that's one thing that I would offer. As a Christian, this one's from our, one of our audience members. So, as a Christian, how can I best support LGBTQ plus friends who have been hurt by the church? That one is, it's complicated, but it's not. Listen. I'm going to say it again. Listen. So often in our culture, we're just ready to jump in with the solution and, and trying to, to heal someone's hurt. But church hurt runs, runs deep. It runs really deep, right? And so giving someone the space and the opportunity to grieve out loud to express their anger and frustration without jumping in and saying, but God, but God, but God still loves you. Like you can, yes, God still loves them, right? But give them the opportunity to voice their pain and their frustration, right? Be the church for them, right? Don't, don't rush into sending them back into a building or a worship service. You, you be the church. Be the hand that they can hold be the friend that they can express their pain and hurt with. Um, I'm like the worst church planter that I, that I know of because people come up to me and they share their stories and I'm like, you know, I, I pray with them, I have coffee with them and then I, I send them on their way or at least I'm ready to and they're like, well, you didn't invite me to your church. I'm like, oh, do you want to come? <laughs> because it's, it's not about me trying to get you into a building, right? It's, it's about your relationship with God. And once we start reprioritizing how this thing works, right, instead of trying to get someone into a program and treating them like a human being, you know, more, more often than not, someone will circle back to me in a few weeks, a, a couple days, in some cases, a couple of years, and say, hey, I remember that conversation we had. Are you still a pastor? Can I, can I come by? Yeah, you can. We're still here, but no pressure. Because that's not what it's about. This one is also from one of our audience members. As a faculty slash staff member, how do I show students I'm a safe, affirming Christian who will accept them? That's a great question. 
Um, there's, I think we're too quick to, to fly the flag sometimes. Like we think that that solves all the issues, right? Like if we just, if we put on a rainbow pin or, um, you know, a sticker somewhere, then students, you know, will feel like they can come to you. And maybe that's true, right? But it's about being, presenting a posture of safety, right? So don't wait for someone to offer their pronouns, offer yours. Let them know that you're seeking to understand and meet folks where they're at. Right? Um, include in your in your lectures or or in your mat learning material different voices. Right? There. Uh, listen. This might be a surprise to you. I'm just going to tell you a secret. Gay people are everywhere. <laughs> we are everywhere. We are in every profession, every area of academia. Every form of entertainment, I know that one surprises a lot of people, <laughs> but we are everywhere, right? So there are ways that you can include other voices into the curriculum that you're teaching, right? If you're teaching a literature class, is everyone straight or cisgender? Listen, I know with all the books being banned at the library that you can find some material to include in your class so it will be representative of a different community, right? It's out there. Um, so do more than just say that you're an ally, but present yourself as an ally in multiple facets. Thank you. All right. During your time as an LGBTQ plus college student, what support did you receive? Or what support did you wish you had received? Yeah, we're going to go with the latter, because I didn't necessarily um, present myself as, as gay in the college that I went to. It probably would have kicked me out. Um, the help I wish I had received, honestly, I, I wish that there had been um, some sort of safe uh, Bible study or um, discussion group where we could have explored the issues um, or some of the passages or, or trying to understand the Bible in the, in the ways that I felt like I was wrestling with. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think at the time I, I probably would have been ready to like fully say that I'm gay. But it would have been helpful for me to at least know that um, there are people willing to listen to the questions that I want to ask. This one's from our, one of our audience members as well. Do you get pushback from other churches in the area? Also, how do you respond to the typical Bible passages people use against you? I don't. No, seriously. There's, there's like, I mean, I can name like three books off the top of my head, right? It's like if you, if you, if you want to have a debate on, on some of these Bible passages, like, I'm not even the real expert, bro. Like, let me just point you to someone that dedicated their life to this. I'm more interested in, in being a pastor and, and leading people um, in their walk of faith. Um, and so I usually don't engage in, in that type of dialogue because there's plenty of research, there's plenty of books, there's plenty of articles, there are theologians with way more degrees than I have who have explored the whole issue, right? So I'm just gonna encourage, I'm gonna encourage my young people here. Um, if someone is coming at you with the clobber passages trying to, um, to diminish who you are as a person, don't, don't even give that, don't let them run space in your mind or on your calendar, right? There's, there's places where if someone actually wants to learn, they can go and access that. Usually when someone comes to you with that, they're not trying to learn, they're just trying to pick a fight. So when we talk about healthy discourse and healthy dialogue, it's, that's usually not the case. Um, now, I say that there, there are, probably exceptions to that, right? Um, and that's fine. Um, again, there are, there are books where people have explored those topics more thoroughly than what you can explain in five minutes or 15 minutes. Um, I, I, receive, I have received pushback in many different ways. Most especially, uh, testing, okay. Move your hand up so it's not covering the receiver on the mic. Thank ah, you. there's a secret. Thank you. Um, 
usually it's in the form of exclusion. So there are conversations and um, opportunities for engagement in the community that I am well qualified to engage with. And depending on who's around that table, I, I am usually not asked to participate. I'm simply not invited anymore. And I know it's an issue with my um, sexuality or sexual orientation because prior to me being vocal about being coming out or coming out, I was invited to lead workshops. I was invited to speaking engagements. I was invited to lead conferences, usually around topics related to um, social justice, racial reconciliation, um, things of, of that nature. Um, and since coming out, all of those opportunities, well, not all of them, most of them have gone away. And so that's, that's the pushback that I receive from the community that most often I'm not welcome. I'm going to take a quick second to mention Bible Pride for those of you who are exploring your faith and want to do so in a loving and accepting environment. This is a queer Bible study run by one of our executive board members at PRISM. If you have questions about it after, we have our executive board member, raise your hand, Aubrey, who runs it, who can tell you more about it. All right, on to the next question. Let's see. What would you say to a teenager, someone who is an open part of the LGBTQIA plus community, about continuing to grow their faith in God without feeling the need to be silent to their church community? That's a lot. Um, yeah, again, safety would be my concern there. You know, it's, it's so odd that I have to repeat safety when we're talking about Christians and church. <laughs> um, but from the stories I've heard and from my own experience, um, some of my own experience, when um, you're, you're dealing with people who are adamant and don't want to um, validate your story. Um, it's often met with violent rhetoric and exclusion in, in many hurtful ways. Um, and so to the young person who um, is, is open about their, their identity or sexual orientation, um, and unabashedly so, I mean, that's awesome. Um, but also uh, probably to prepare yourself for, for some pushback. Um, and to understand that not everybody's going to be ready to accept you as you are, but continue to be confident in who God created you to be. I believe this is also a question from one of our audience members. What does psychology say about the brain of a child who has been sexually, assault, sexually violated? Is there a direct correlation for children who are violated becoming LGBTQ plus adults? Um, yeah, that sounds like a question that's kind of fishing. <laughs> uh, for, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. There is one here who could answer. David Meyer has written the world textbook on the website. If you want to answer now, he can give it to you. All right, so find him later. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stick to the realm that I'm most familiar with, which is churches. Um, so often, um, churches are like these huge spaces um, with, with resources that are available, um, and the expectation is that people are going to come to you, right? Um, that's not being the missional church. That's not the way that works, right? You need to go out and serve. And you know what? This is, this is a challenge to regardless as where, where you stand on this issue or on the questions, like you're called to go out to the people, right? Um, so I just had a, a conversation with um, someone at the Pride Center at, um, in Grand Rapids, and one of the things we were talking about was um, there's, there's this huge need in the LGBTQ community, um, and there are resources that have, our churches that have resources, but People don't necessarily feel safe going to the church for, for what they need. That's wild. 
That's, when, you, when you sit back and think about that, that's so wild. Right? The churches have cloth, uh, clothing pantries, food pantries, um, resources for, for families and children, and there are people that are afraid to come to you to get what they need because of how they might be treated when they get there. And so, you know, my, my advice would be that we, we, or my thought would be that we as a high church community and culture need to reimagine what the church looks like because we're still trying to fill our pews when God might be leading us to go out to meet the need where, where people are hurting right now on the street because they're not gonna come to us. We have to engage that differently and I think uh, we have to think missionally, we have to think proactively about how to serve the people in our community. Regardless of their sexual orientation. Great question. Um, the title is escaping me right now, but uh, God and the Gay Christian. I believe that's the title of the book by Matthew Vines. That's that's my go-to to to recommend for folks who are just trying to like navigate this and figure this out. Like, how do you wrestle with, you know, is the Bible the Word of God, and if so, what do I do with these passages? Um, it's very thoughtful. Um, it's it's very careful. Um, it's very kind, and I think it's it's a great way for someone to engage in, in understanding um, some of the questions. Um, there are several others, but I think that's the the, the one I would point to, to the most. What do you feel is the most important attribute to look for in people and places when it comes to searching for a safe space slash person? A safe space or a safe person. Um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. That, that's part of the problem. It's not something that you can identify right away, right? It's, it's something that you have to kind of navigate and figure out and test the waters a little bit. Um, it's, it's easier when there is like a rainbow flag present or something like that, that kind of gives a signal that maybe someone is at least trying or at least, um, you know, putting some sort of symbol out there that, that you might be welcome. Um, but it's, it's more than that. I mean, I've been to places that fly the flag and are, are terrible, are terrible to, to our community. Um, and so, unfortunately, it's, it's just one of those things you have to navigate. That being said, there are um, organizations or resources out there, for example, um, the Pride Center of Grand Rapids has a list of resources of places where you can go that you would be safe, right? Um, and so that's been something that's been tried, tested, and true because other people are attesting to it. Um, so that would be a way for you to um, kind of navigate that. Um, you know, our church website, for example, has a list of resources that you can go to so that you can at least start your journey in places that we have felt okay engaging with. Um, and so you don't have to figure this all out by yourself. Um, there's, there's things that you can look into, some research you can um, look into as well. Um, so there's, there's ways that you can navigate it without totally putting yourself out there. As, you've, as you've grown older and have many years of experience navigating the prejudice and stigma surrounding the idea of being in the LGBTQ plus community, what strategies or tips do you have for individuals seeking to follow a similar path to yours, i.e. becoming a pastor? Ooh, don't. Um, <laughs> you gotta be called to this one, baby. Um, you, you, gotta, you gotta know that this is where God is leading you because it's a hard road. Um, at this time in, in our culture, um, it, it is not easy. That being said, um, what paths to take, uh, there are places you can go where, where you can have conversations. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna highlight it. Uh, the, the UCC is a place where I have felt safe to go and, and have conversations about re-engaging in, um, in a larger body of work in ministry. Um, 
you know, find, find appropriate venues of places where, where other people are growing and learning, right? So like, I might not send you to one particular seminary because it's very clear what, what they believe in, um, and, and that you would not be welcome there. Um, and that would just be putting yourself in, in a difficult situation. Um, but there are people that have been down the road a little bit, so um, finding mentors, finding people that you can connect with, um, exploring that in, in safe places. I am a safe place if you want to um, explore that question, if that's you, you're wondering, I might be called to this, I, I think I might be interested in being a pastor. You're gonna come to me and I'm gonna say don't do it, and then we're gonna have coffee and we're gonna talk about it some more. Um, yeah, so I, I offer that. Am I doing the right thing by being an accepting voice in a non-affirming church? We all leave, does that diminish the change, chance for change? I've dealt with this question a lot, and I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest with you. I go back and forth. So there are, there are churches that are open and affirming and struggling because they don't have denominational support. Um, and so by you being in a church that is not open and, aff and affirming, um, but maybe proactively going against that, would, would your time and money be better used somewhere else? Would your gifts be better used somewhere else? At the same time, yeah, it's true. There are, there are places where if you leave, maybe no one else is gonna be asking the hard questions. But then you have to ask yourself at what cost? Are you alone enough to turn that wheel? And in most cases where I have these conversations with people, they're not, right? They have to connect to, to a larger body of folks that are willing to engage in that work. Um, and it's a lot of trial. And it's not for everyone. It is certainly not for everyone. It is, I'll tell you this, you're not Jesus. And it's not up to you to save your church or your denomination and give, get them on the right path. You do what you have to do, say what you have to say, do what you can. And then eventually you might be called to shake the dust off your feet and go on to the next place, right? So you have to be discerning. There is no cookie cutter answer for that. Um, be prayerful, be led by the Holy Spirit, um, but know that it, at some point it might be time for you to go, and it's okay. You don't have to feel guilt or shame for quote unquote giving up on your church. It's not your church, it's God's church. Let God deal with that. Right? I could say more, but let's stop there. You mentioned earlier that you didn't feel it was your responsibility to come out to everyone you met before. Do you do that now? I don't. I don't. Um, if I, it's, it's, it's this weird thing in, in our culture right now where, um, it's, a, it's something you have to navigate a little bit, but it, it's just the reality. Straight people don't have to come out, right? You don't see straight people having hard conversations with their parents like, Mom, I got something to tell you. You know, I know this is gonna come to shock to you, but I'm a boy and I like girls. It's not a conversation that, that is necessary, right? But the process of coming out for someone that identifies as a part of the queer community, you're gonna do it for the rest of your life. You will always be coming out to someone. If you change into a new environment, go to a new neighborhood, start a new job, you're always going to be coming out and it's, it's part of our struggle right now in this generation. Um, that being said, I don't feel it's necessary for me to put my business out there all the time. You, you don't, if I'm only gonna, listen, I'm a little street, okay? If I'm only gonna be dealing with you for five minutes, you don't gotta know my business, you don't need to know that I have a husband and a dog, like, <laughs> right? But there are certain situations where I might be coming into um, something that's community related or, or work related, where this relationship is gonna be ongoing for a while. I'm one of those people that likes to rip off the band-aid, so I just come in and I'm like, hey girl, what's going on? Right, because I, I need you to know so that this doesn't come to you as a surprise, come as a surprise to you later, right? And we can just put all the cards on the table. 
Um, and I'll be honest, that's a defense mechanism that I've sort of developed after being rejected so many times. So it's a hard thing to navigate, um, but you get better at it. say, if you're here to make fries, stay on fries. One person got that. <laughs> it's, we, we tend to treat the church as an institution that needs to have its fingers everywhere. Right? But the church is us as a people. Right? We are the called people of God. So you being in a space, if you're, if you're Christian, if you're following Jesus, you are the church in that space. It doesn't necessarily mean that an institutional church needs to be involved at every facet, at every decision-making level. Like, we treat the church like they're lobbyists. Right? And I'm pretty sure that wasn't the intention that Christ had for us um, as, as his followers, right? There are certain things that need to be challenged, certain tables that need to be flipped over, but usually it's in spaces where people are being marginalized and oppressed, not in spaces where, um, not in spaces that, um, where, where the church, you know what? I'm about to go off. <laughs> Trying to hold back, y'all. Um, <laughs> let me just say that it's, it, I'm not advocating for the church not to be involved in higher education, but what I am saying is know your lane, right? Don't impose your values on someone else, right? Let the Holy Spirit do its work and stop taking the place of what we say the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. Cultivating joy is important, it is necessary. Um, what brings me joy is honestly um, being with my church family. Knowing that I have a community of, of queer individuals that are willing to suffer and hurt and rejoice with one another, regardless of the obstacles that we have faced. Um, we are family to each other, we hold each other up, we text each other. Um, we watch TV together. <laughs> um, we go out to dinner together. We, we become a support network. Um, and so that's something that has become dear to me. When I struggle getting up in the morning, um, if I ever start thinking about the folks in my church and how to serve them, you know, it gets me right up and, and, and about my day. Um, I think cultivating joy is finding your people in the LGBTQ community. You have to find your people. And I'm not necessarily saying like, you know, just go hang out with a bunch of gay people. What I am saying is, is find your people. Find the people that are family, um, especially for those of us that have been ostracized or pushed out of our, um, of our, our nuclear family because of our identity. Um, it's so important to find people that you can share and dwell and have life with. Um, that's one of the ways that you can create joy. And it, it's a process. Um, it's not always easy. Um, I know I've said that like a million times already. It's a process, it's a process, it's a process. But it's true. Um, some of it is trial and error, but you'll, you'll find your people. So I, I do community theater um, when I have free time, which is very often. But man, I know when I'm surrounded by 
Hey, I see y'all. Um, I know that I'm surrounded by my theater folks, right? Because we can just jump in and we start quoting crazy things and people show up in costumes and it's not Halloween and it's just like, you know, those those are those are my people, right? Because we connect, we have that that um, that family feel together. You can find your people. They're there, right? You might have to dig a little bit, but I bet you that treasure's in the field. I would like to thank you again for speaking here today. Thank you to all those who were involved in this event. PRISM, GROPE, Advisory Council, and the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. It is my hope that every person here today will become an agent of change for equity and inclusion. Thank you all for coming today. If you are interested in purchasing Reverend Ricardo Tavares' artwork today, there is a table set up in the back. There is also an informational booth for both Enviville Church and New City neighbors to learn more about their work. Thank you again. <laughs>